Good morning, everyone. This is uh, this is Dr. Meng Meng Yu, uh, a system professor extension specialist at the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. I'm housed in the uh, Department of Horticulture Sciences. And welcome to today's webinar, part of the Spring Quick Bite webinar series. Uh, and, and today is actually our inaugural uh, webinar of the series. So, um, and these webinars are, are designed to be no longer than 30 minutes and give you a quick insight look at some of the progress, uh, issues, problems that we are facing today in the, uh, in the green industry. Many of you are probably very familiar with the uh, GoToWebinar format, so I won't waste too much of your time going into the details on the control panel. And I have uh, everyone except myself and Dr. Robbins, and I have everyone muted to uh, minimize the background noise so you could keep your cell phone, you know, on and everything. Uh, we won't have to uh, hear that. Um, if you have questions, you could either text, uh, you could either text in in this uh, in in this in this box uh, this box here in the question box, or you could email it to me, mgu at tamu.edu. The questions will be uh, answered at the end of the presentation. Today we have Dr. Jim Robbins from the University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service to talk about an exciting project that he has been working on in the past two to three years. Uh, UAVs in agriculture and more specifically, you know, the application in uh, nursery inventory automation. Dr. Robbins has been a, uh, a nationally known expert, uh, you know, on nursery production woody ornamentals, and he has been invited to a TNLA uh, Expo to speak on many things. So, uh, Dr. Robbins, I will give you the right as a presenter. You can take it uh, from here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gu. Thank you, Dr. Gu. Um, well, I'm honored and excited to be uh, involved in the inaugural uh, webinar um, with your Quick Bites. Uh, I really think this is a, a brilliant concept and uh, look forward to uh, how this uh, develops. Uh, and Hello? Sorry, something uh, glitch happened there. Okay, so uh, I want to talk on UAVs and nursery production. And um, this may be, uh, while it's probably the most rewarding project I've worked on, uh, it also may be one of the most uh, challenging and frustrating. And so I'm borrowing this quote uh, from someone that did a TED uh, conference. When you're trying something new, hard, or innovative, failure is not only inevitable, but it is also sometimes necessary. And it applies uh, very closely to this uh, area of research. So the question is, is this in the future for nursery production? And I very firmly, firmly believe that uh, UAVs um, will, be, uh, uh, will be in our future in, in many ways. And so uh, Dr. Gu has asked me to kind of go over uh, what we're currently doing and some of the vision for how UAVs may uh, be applied to nursery production. First, I think we need to just have a quick nomenclature lesson. Um, there, first of all, there is nothing unmanned about an unmanned system. I mean, there still has to be an operator, um, but they may just be at a remote site. Second, there are many names that are used uh, to describe these uh, platforms. Um, one is unmanned aircraft system, or UAS. The other is unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. Uh, a third one, which I learned recently at a conference, is remotely piloted aircraft systems. And the last is the one that we least prefer, uh, which is a drone. Uh, that, unfortunately, is the one that's used most recently in uh, uh, just the uh, trade publications. And uh, But it, it just irritates us because it uh, infers kind of a visual thing about uh, something that's flying and, and shooting missiles, or uh, but that's really no bearing to what we are, the platform we are using. Um, I suspect that all of you, uh, if you, 
if you were unaware of uh, UAVs, uh, I suspect you became aware of this about a month ago when uh, Jeff Bezos had his 60 Minutes interview, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, uh, where he disclosed that they were working on this uh, package delivery system using UAVs. And uh, whether it was good, bad, or otherwise, um, it's certainly the uh, social media was a Twitter with uh, conversations about this uh, this area, um, this topic area. Um, how do I envision UAS or UAVs will be used in the nursery? And I um, identified four. The first is for crop monitoring. Um, so for instance, nutrients. And I'll show you an example of this. But where we might be monitoring um, ITAs or crepe myrtles uh, for whether you know, there's some kind of a nutrient deficiency uh, uh, is one vision. Second, clearly, is for water uh, monitoring. And Dr. Jim Owen, our team member at uh, Virginia Tech, is already working on this. Um, so using these UAVs to uh, uh, monitor for water status. Pest also for, uh, again, identifying not necessarily the pest itself, but whether there is an issue on the nursery related to spider mites or aphids. Um, you will see something is wrong very easily, and then you would go send someone to investigate. Second major area is chemical applications. And this is an area where I see um, that the nursery industry, nursery industry and specialty crops, this is an ideal application for these platforms. And the reason being it tends to be fairly small acreage. Um, these platforms are already being used extensively in Japan on uh, Again, small acreage uh, agriculture. Do I envision that these uh, UAVs will be used to make chemical application, for example, in Arkansas on a 3,000 acre rice farm? And I clearly see uh, say the answer is no. Um, I think just traditional fixed wing uh, 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 airplanes will continue to be used. Uh, so they, crop testers don't need to be worried. Third area is land and building management. And you may find this odd at first, but um, this actually came up in some demonstrations that we've done at nurseries. Um, one in particular, when we did a live feed while flying over their um, extensive retractable roof structures, they envisioned how this would just be a benefit, a tremendous benefit to them uh, to inspect cables, motors, et cetera, very easily. Second example, we were at a nursery on the West Coast, and uh, in collecting the image and later viewing it, uh, none of the, the nursery could not identify there was a, a shadowy streak in the uh, gravel bed. And it turns out that they identified a uh, all but forgotten uh, drain tile system um, that was easily visible from the air. And the final category is the area where I'm really actively conducting research, which is in crop inventory management. What kind of UAS platforms are available to you? There's really two uh, categories. One is rotary, which is shown here, and the second would be fixed wing, and I'll show that to you in just a moment. And I could spend an hour just talking about the variety of platforms, and it seems like every week a new company is coming on board somewhere in the world uh, to provide these platforms. A unique twist to this, by the way, um, has come to light in the last uh, uh, several months where they're uh, attaching a, a lightweight tether and the reason being uh, as, a, as a way to get around the current FAA regulations which is really another webinar in itself. So a variety of rotary platforms, the one we use is in the upper right hand corner. The other general platform would be a fixed wing um, and again many many manufacturers um, out there and here's just a few examples. What I'd like to move into now is specifically talk about our collective experiences. And when I mean our, uh, I'll acknowledge the team at the end, but there's been a lot of people involved in this. And I'm uh, unfortunate that I'm the only one that's speaking. Uh, but there's a lot of collective efforts involved. So we've had two broad categories. One is inventory management for both Christmas trees, open field nurseries, and citrus orchards. And the second broad category is crop management. Um, Let's start with uh, Christmas tree uh, farm. And uh, uh, this is an aerial photograph uh, from Oregon. Um, I think they lead the nation in Christmas tree production. It's on very rolling terrain, uh, very large acreage. 
but it's extremely difficult to get accurate inventory counts. And as you can see, even uh, if you just wanted to print this image, it'd be a, you could manually count these easier than what you could do from the ground. Uh, so we started working on this, and we also have visions of trying to also obtain the uh, uh, tree height, which would so they would have count and uh, and tree height information. Uh, second area is the one that I'm most closely aligned with, which is um, uh, container production. And um, uh, this is a you know photograph at a large uh, commercial nursery, and you can see this would be pretty typical for uh, mid spring or late spring uh, during shipment, where you get this Swiss cheese effect and it becomes extremely difficult for a human being to get accurate counts. Um, and so this is where we feel that the strength of this approach uh, may uh, lie, is uh, not just when you put out a, uh, an initial uh, uh, canned block where they're uh, tight and uh, everything's full, but later when things uh, uh, have been harvested. The other issue is uh, this is Dr. Reza Asani, uh, another team member at the University of Florida. Uh, they were using this system and software to get an account of citrus trees and groves and also estimate the uh, width, which is something, again, that we would apply to nursery crops. Um, by combining those two, they can estimate citrus yield. Um, so again, this is not necessarily an ornamental nursery, but again, the same concept can be applied to uh, ornamental nurseries, uh, transferable to ornamental uh, nurseries. Just wanted to show you some examples of things we're uh, working on. The other area, and again, this is on citrus, is disease or stress detection. And just again to allude that by using this platform and attaching a specific sensor, uh, in this case, they were looking for very serious disease on, on uh, citrus. Uh, Hulong B disease, our uh, citrus screening. And again, um, we we're starting to demonstrate that you can use this approach for, for uh, disease monitoring. And again, using uh, special spectral sensors, uh, lightweight sensors, uh, you can get images and then interpret uh, the information. The other area, and again, it's not nursery crops, but again, should be transferable. Dr. Asani has been working on uh, nutrient status of sugarcane, and again, um, with the thought that, again, using specific sensors uh, and wavelengths, uh, you could uh, make some uh, uh, correlation and uh, identify a correlation so that you could specifically say uh, this, this bed, this area, is, uh, may have some kind of a nutrient deficiency. Again, back to um, the area that I am most um, focused on right now, which is plant inventory. As you all know, it's right now a strictly a manual process. Yes, we have tablets uh, as a way to transfer the information. Uh, there is some use of uh, barcodes and RFID to, to collect the, the information. Um, but again, it's really not a fully automated system uh, similar to the one we're working on. Just to show you an example, uh, so these are research plots, but uh, we put these container crops at different spacing. Uh, collect uh, images, uh, and then we analyze them using, uh, we're evaluating different software platforms, uh, trying to see how well they adapt from their current applications uh, to uh, counting plants. And again, we also hope to use the same software to get uh, plant size information uh, so that you would nearly get a, a complete uh, inventory report. Um, if you're interested uh, in the most recent issue of nursery management, uh, the collective team, we just uh, provided an update on our efforts on this uh, inventory issue. And uh, so uh, you can read more about that in the latest issue of nursery management. Um, what do you gain by uh, using a UAS? Um, and again, these are some of the shots that we've taken. This is all Christmas trees. Um, uh, but uh, here's a couple of issues or uh, benefits. One is uh, as-needed basis, um, and I'll give you a side story. When we first started this work, we hired a company out of Colorado to fly over a 3,000-acre nursery in Oregon to, to get us uh, an image. Um, they had to wait several months because of uh, overcast conditions, which are very common in Oregon. And the cost was $3,000 for that one farm. Um, so. What we envision is these platforms um, uh, 
in tip in general uh, can be used on a more as needed basis um, than a fixed wing platform. Um, however, again, that we could get into a lengthy discussion about um, uh, whether this how often this applies and under what conditions. The second is that it's a vertical takeoff, so I don't mess with these. Uh, many of these I don't need a landing strip or anything, so very simple uh, uh, logistically. The cost, again, remember I mentioned $3,000 for one image, and uh, that would buy you basically one of these uh, well-equipped uh, UAVs. Pre-programmed pre -programmed flight, so the vision is, as you can look at that photograph, what we do is we say, you go and you will go over phase C, D, and E, uh, and then come back to a starting point. So uh, these things are very um, highly uh, controlled uh, devices, the types that we use, and so um, uh, they have automatic takeoff, automatic landing, and pre-programmed flight options. Resolution is really the key. Um, so on the left, you're saying uh, maybe a flight would be uh, 20 inch, 10 inch, 9 inch, something like it depends on where the image was taken uh, and the sensor. Um, on the right, the current work we're doing, um, we are getting uh, down to one millimeter, one millimeter resolution. Um, and it's actually a disadvantage. It's giving our software problems and that it's overwhelming it with information. But um, give you an idea about the types of resolution capability that you have, um, not only with the platform, but uh, the appropriate sensor. Is this the futuristic farm? Um, I strongly believe that these are going to be uh, used extensively in a variety of uh, agricultural applications. Um, I, I say this is a hot topic in agriculture, and I mean that sincerely. I probably find uh, at least five to six uh, articles per week. Um, I mean, I'm just inundated with articles about them being used in uh, uh, potatoes, turf grass, uh, uh, upper right is um, in vineyards, uh, so yes, they they are they are here and they are here to stay. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. is a late arrival. Uh, Japan and other countries are way ahead of us, um, and the reason we're behind primarily is due to regulations. Um, however, it's never too late, and I think you know we're seeing um, some momentum shift. But uh, uh, there are a number of countries that are way ahead in the use and application of these for agricultural use. Um, there are two challenges to widespread adoption. Uh, on the left is safety and then the right is privacy. And these are two distinctly separate uh, uh, issues. Um, safety really should be addressed by the FAA and privacy, I guess, by Congress or someone else. But uh, the two separate issues, although often they get uh, intermingled. Um, this quote, the challenge for industry is that the public perception of this technology is being shaped by 1% of its uh, uh, use. Uh, as far as the FAA regulations as they stand right now, they currently have three classes of use. First is a hobby or recreational. Uh, second is public agencies, under which I fall. And the third is commercial. The last two, public agency and commercial, have extremely limited or almost non, uh, no use right now. Uh, it took one of the delays in our project was it took us nearly 12 months to uh, complete the FAA process to fly what you as a homeowner could fly in uh, immediately. So uh, it, it's uh, hampered our ability to uh, work with these platforms. FAA regulations, um, if you hold a private pilot's license to fly, say a small uh, twin-engine Cessna, interestingly, and you work for a public agency, uh, police department, uh, university, et cetera, Believe it or not, uh, you can't fly this. Uh, you've got to get uh, special uh, certification, training, licensing. Uh, it's time consuming and expensive. Uh, interesting that this uh, um, uh, Northrop Grumman uh, uh, full-size drone is covered by the exact same rules currently as this uh, small uh, uh, DR uh, drone uh, which you could buy for $250 at Best Buy or Amazon. What is needed? We need a rational process to ensure safety in our airspace and protect privacy. However, the current FAA regulations are presenting unrealistic barriers for interested users in agriculture and other applications. Challenges, um, what do I see are some issues short term that we need to work on? Extended battery life. Um, uh, it's just like you know, a battery operated car you hear about, you know, extending battery life. Um, 
a variety of UAVs. I mean, there's just an overwhelming number of choices. Um, and I think as time proceeds, the number of platforms will eventually start dropping as the better performers uh, rise to the top. Um, research just data about reliability and uh, uh, how we can use these and under what conditions, uh, weather robust. And the final one is one that's uh, just plaguing me right now is uh, solar flare, which is uh, causing problems in some of our uh, navigation. Um, I would encourage you, if you're really interested in this topic, um, the Association of Unmanned uh, Vehicle Systems International, AUVSI, uh, published last year an excellent um, booklet. It's called The Economic Impact, and you can easily download it from the internet. So AUVSI, and just do Economic Impact. Um, and they go uh, collectively by the nation, and then individually by states, and it's a very in-depth report uh, talking about uh, use and uh, its application in particular in precision agriculture. Um, I really would like to acknowledge again, um, uh, this is a team e effort and uh, there's some great people in the upper right. Um, starting on the left is Dr. Uh, Dharmendra Saraswat from the University of Arkansas. Uh, next to Dharmendra moving to the right is Heather Stoven, a research technician with Oregon State, just an exceptional person. Uh, Joe Capillas with a private consulting firm, uh, Dr. Joe Maja in the middle who actually builds most of our systems. Uh, to his right, Chow Langren, a forester, and then Jim Owen who was at Oregon State and is now at Virginia Tech. And then collectively there's others. The one I want to point out in the lower is the person third from the left. That's Dr. Reza Hassani who at, at the University of Florida who's uh, again been a huge uh, contributor to this uh, entire project. And lastly, I want to give acknowledgement to the two graduate students that are currently working on this. Uh, Jose Lopez on the left at the University of Arkansas, who's working on the plant count, and Ying Shua at the University of Florida, who's actually writing some software that we hope will help in this counting process. If it wasn't for their collective efforts, um, I mean, we would just not be making progress. Um, acknowledgements, we have had some very, very small funding from the Oregon Association of Nurseries, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, the J. Frank Schmidt Family Charitable Foundation was kind enough to get us some seed money to start this uh, about five years ago. Uh, J. Frank Schmidt and Son Nursery, Bailey Nurseries, Greenleaf Nurseries, uh, Brantley Nursery in Florida has also helped out. Um, and then um, we're uh, starting to do some work uh, thanks to a grant from the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Board. Um, if you have additional questions outside of this uh, webinar, feel free to uh, contact me. Um, my email address is, uh, is shown at the bottom, and I'd be happy to uh, uh, have uh, email or telephone conversations uh, with you. Again, I wish to acknowledge Dr. Gu starting this series, and, and I'm honored that this is the inaugural one. Um, it, uh, I certainly am passionate about this uh, area of research and would be happy to uh, discuss it with any of you. That concludes my presentation, Dr. Gu. Well, thank you, Dr. Robbins. Uh, I, I um, noticed that you, I noticed that you mentioned that uh, um, uh, green leaf nursery, and and we actually have several. Uh, like uh, like Richard Young, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they are from uh, uh, Greenleaf Nursery here in uh, in Texas. So just just want to point that out to you. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, since they're on, I mean, I already acknowledged, but uh, I mean, uh, the crew at the uh, Park Hill, Oklahoma, um, have just been uh, exceptionally. Uh, patient with us and uh, we you know we, we can't thank uh, these collaborators enough because uh, uh, they've had uh, you know we it involves a lot of work and patience on their part so we uh, uh, tremendously appreciate their uh, participation otherwise we would really not be where we are yeah uh, Richard young mark Rainey uh, I may uh, miss some other names you know from uh, Greenleaf nursery so well um, I that's the uh, end of uh, Dr. Robbins' uh, uh, presentation. So now let's open it, uh, you know, for two questions. By the way, you could either type the question in the uh, in in the in the question panel, or you could uh, uh, email me, and I 
and then I'll uh, bring it up to Dr. Robbins. While you're typing your questions, I just want to remind you that uh, um, uh, at the end of the webinar, we'd like to invite you to answer a very short seven-question evaluation survey with uh, just a simple multiple choice. And you know, this webinar is co-sponsored by TNLA and Southern Region Risk Management Education Center. And it's important that uh, we provide feedbacks about these webinars to our grantors, uh, providing funding to offset the cost of webinars. And we have also uh, scheduled two more, and there, you know, uh, others in the series in um, in planning. Um, uh, one is coping with basal downy mildew. That's uh, Tuesday, March 18th, 10:30 to 11. Uh, and also current situation on crepe myrtle bark scale. You know, if you are dealing with landscapes or um, uh, you know. That you've seen some uh, the blackish things, you know, the sooty mold on um, crepe myrtles that could be the bark scale, which is a, a pretty bad insect. Um, so that's on Wednesday, April the 2nd. By the way, if there are any questions, that, um, did anyone last week happen to see the uh, video from um, Lake Maid Beer Company up in uh, Minnesota where they um, it's a great marketing ploy that they showed where they would uh, transport a uh, small case of uh, beer bottles out to ice fishermen out on a lake. And uh, as the story went, then as soon as they posted it or shortly after the FAA, because it was catching so much buzz, uh, it caught the attention of the FAA and they said, you know, uh, you don't have a license to do that. That would be a commercial use. Um, and so they told them to uh, cease and desist. But uh, if you haven't seen the video, it's it's a hoot. So go to, it's one word, Lake Maid, M-A-I-D, Lake Maid Beer. And uh, they've got a cute video here showing them trying to deliver beer to uh, ice fishermen. Uh, Dr. Robbins, we have a question here. Uh, when do you think these software applications to count the inventory will be ready to share with the nursery industry? A great question. Um, uh, I'm going to be truthful. We have been limited um, again uh, by funding, and so I don't. I I don't want to be quoting this, but let's say over the last five years we may have had uh, thirty thousand dollars or something um, from agencies or nurseries, um, and we are greatly indebted to that. Um, the, the four universities have probably, on in kind, in other words, just uh, 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 attached this to other types of projects uh, and continued to work. So we've probably done uh, contributed three, four times that, um, just uh, piggybacking that on other projects. Um, Again, as a result of the two graduate students, we're making great progress, and it shows when we you know, have focused effort, we, we make efficient, uh, fast progress. Uh, right now, we have no, my graduate student will finish in August, and the PhD student uh, probably a year following. Um, and we have currently have no additional support funding. So um, if we don't, get another graduate student or we don't get any significant funding, it's going to slow down again to a, a very slow pace. So if uh, the answer is really dependent upon uh, support and um, if, uh, so I mean if we could get a significant grant uh, to support this one of the specialty crop uh, research initiative grants, which I'm sure some of you are aware of the, what are called, we call SCREES. Um, we've tried several times, and fortunately, as a result of the farm bill passing last week, it looks like uh, that program will continue, and I think it's been a tremendous benefit uh, to the ornamentals uh, industry. Um, so if we can get some significant dollars, um, I think we can get this thing finished up very quickly, honestly, maybe with, in less than two years. Um, to actually have something that would be uh, usable. And what we want is, is a very user-friendly interface. The vision is that uh, you will use some platform uh, to obtain images um, from your business. 
you will then uh, then just load them into the computer and on the screen we would envision having uh, the screen with uh, 12 to 15 images of scenes and you would say this most closely uh, matches mine you would um, we would already have written a software to analyze your image and it would then process your image and give you the uh, output information for sure count and we would we know that we can do uh, average width um, height is possible it's just going to be a little more difficult so um, if we had significant funding I would say within two years we could have uh, it on your desktop if we don't it's you know five years uh, just because it we it, it just uh, we, we just can't make fast progress when we're just piggybacking this under other uh, other projects. Dr. Robbins, I remember that uh, you you mentioned there, you know, a private, public, and the eight, you know, and the commercial agency. You passed certain uh, tests, but for a nursery to apply this to use this UAV, they don't really need any. They don't need to go pass any tests, you know, do they? Well, and let me before I, I w I'd love to answer that. Uh, let me just one more thing, by the way. Um, if, if this subject area interests you and you feel it benefits the nursery industry, and what I mean by uh, trying to automate the inventory process, we need to know that. Uh, there are a number of people that are challenging us uh, that are saying this has, is useless, it has no benefit. You have never demonstrated that it's actually a problem. Uh, so. Um, that is a, a real hurdle that we face with this project. So if you feel strongly that this is a, an area that could significantly uh, impact and improve the nursery industry, that, you know, uh, we would love to know that because, again, we frequently get challenged that this has no benefit, that you've never demonstrated this is even an issue in the nursery industry that, uh, that uh, inventory process is um, a limitation. We have now, let, me move on, let me move on to your question. Um, so those three categories, um, the commercial categories you can imagine, uh, the easiest way to define it is if you receive money for a service, then that's called commercial. So many of you are probably aware of real estate companies or others. Um, we have two in the state of Arkansas that for a fee say that they will give you an aerial photograph of your property. Now what they say is that they're actually uh, giving you the aerial image for free and they're coming out and like giving you some advice or something, but I'm sure that the FAA has a totally different interpretation. So um, you, I, I believe uh, it would be correct to say that if you purchased um, Here's the sticky part. If a nursery purchases a UAV platform and flies it, um, I still think the FAA might uh, say that it's for commercial use because it was purchased and is being used uh, for the business. Uh, I guess you could say, well, uh, I happen to have one as a recreational hobby person and I brought it to the business and you know took these pictures. So this is it's kind of a gray area. Um, how to interpret that. And remember what, there's two parts to this uh, accounting. One is the use, uh, obtaining aerial images, and that could be by a, an airplane, it could be by these UAVs, could be a by a boom. The, third, the second component is uh, developing software that can then translate that information into something that's useful, and whether that's crop monitoring or plant count, um, and that's what we are working on is trying to evaluate, we're trying to adapt uh, off the shelf and then uh, uh, the student at Florida is writing her own software which truthfully looks very, very promising uh, right now and uh, probably is performing better than the off the shelf software. Um, but so there's two parts. One is obtaining images. Um, for whatever application, and then the second is uh, being able to use that information uh, to your benefit. 
Uh, Dr. Robbins, we actually have uh, two questions and one comment coming in. So one is uh, asked by Bill, are you looking at any methods of photographic analysis other than human visual view of the photo? Uh, could Bill give me an example of what he's referring to? Okay, hold on. I'm going to unmute. Um, yeah. Um, Bill, uh, Bill, you're uh, unmuted, so go ahead. Okay, I'll just, um, I got the impression that uh, most of the analysis of the, uh, the photos and the presentation just gave, gave the person a bird's eye view of their crop and they could sit there and count off the photograph as their software. I think I've gotten part of the answer from what you've been discussing, but will software be able to take that photo and actually do the counts and do the measuring on the size of the of the, um, the plant and all that. Okay, great. I mean, I, again, I apologize because that obviously didn't come across clearly in the presentation, but yeah, that's what um, I showed two slides. Um, the University of Arkansas and the University of Florida are currently evaluating three different software packages to automate that process. Um, so that you would take this digital image and you would run it through software and it would generate a, a, for sure a count. We can also, uh, the same software um, with fairly easy, uh, um, not, it's not too difficult, can give average plant width. Height is a more challenging um, uh, you know, metric for us to produce, but we, we have some ideas on how to do that. So it goes back to, remember I said that you would sit, you would go take a photograph, a digital photograph, and by the way, all we, we just use standard homeowner cameras that are remotely triggered from the ground. Um, there's nothing unique about that for, for the plant inventory work. And then, again, what I'm envisioning is that you would sit, you would collect this image or images, you would go back to your, um, your office you would put your thumb drive into your computer, uh, you would open up the image, and then you would um, open up the software, and you would say, okay, my situation looks most like this. In other words, it might be uh, field-grown trees, it might be 15-gallon um, uh, shrubs, something like that. And you'd say, it looks like this, and then you would uh, apply that software to that image, and it would generate a count for you. And that's what, again, that's what uh, we're, we are most focused on right now is, uh, is this plant count using uh, software. Okay. The, uh, the next question is from, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a, a, a comment from Neil. Neil says, it's, it is the future and the work needs to be continued. This will have significant impact. Ask anyone who challenges that to go out and experience what manual inventory control is like and they will quickly see the power of these uh, uh, technology. Uh, and Neil asked when, well, when do you think these software applications will be available to the nursery industry? So that was answered. Um, Richard, Richard. Well, wait, let me, let me, uh, when will be, again, um, and, you know, again, we're, we're using currently two software packages um, that are off the shelf. Another one is what the student is literally writing. And at this point, I'd say that in general, her software, her algorithm, seems to be uh, very successful and fairly simple. Um, so, uh, but that's the whole part of this research is trying to evaluate for you um, uh, is there one of these uh, software packages that is best suitable for this type of an application? You need to understand that the two that are currently or that are commercially available are they're probably used uh, or developed for military applications to look for certain types of objects in satellite images, and we're trying to adapt these, um, downsize them to you know specifically. Uh, look for 
you know, plants and uh, uh, in our nurseries and, and get us this uh, inventory information. Next question. Dr. Gu? Dr. Gu? Sorry, I just unmuted myself. The, uh, the next question, oh, okay. yeah, sorry. The next question is from uh, Richard. Do you have any information on when the FAA is going to publish rules for commercial use of UAS? Excellent question, Richard. Okay, so we, um, we are keenly aware of this whole process because it impacts us. And um, so uh, it was a presidential uh, request that by September of 2015, uh, the Obama administration is requiring the FAA to uh, develop and implement new guidelines for unmanned aerial vehicles. We currently use what are called interim guidelines, and that's where the problem comes in, is they were written many, many years ago, and this is very typical, where the technology has advanced faster than the regulations. And the FAA um, has no, um, they are absolute, you follow these regulations to the T. And, um, but it's just really, uh, and it's a very rigorous process. Um, and I give you the example that my co-pilot is a certified um, private pilot. He has his own plane. He is not. At, at, at the outset uh, uh, qualified to fly our three pound battery powered UAV. Uh, he had to go, he had to get a commercial license uh, to be able to fly this. And so it's, uh, again, and they, they are uncompromising in, the, uh, in this. It's, uh, and this is for public use. And, uh, you know, there's several hundred um, what are called Certificate of Authorizations, or we call them COAs, that have been granted by the FAA. And fortunately, we have one. It will expire in August of this year. And um, so I'll have to go back through and, uh, um, you know, go through the process of renewing this, which is uh, going to be uh, time consuming and expensive. If for commercial application, I don't know the exact number, but there's very, very few, and it would be limited to these companies that are developing these platforms. Uh, they obviously need authorization to test them. Beyond that, there is no other commercial application that I am aware of. So all of these real estate companies, Lake Maid Beer Company, um, there are some companies that are advertising that they will come out and do some of these activities for you right now. Uh, there's a company in the Portland area that has made a presentation to nurseries out there. Um, clearly, that uh, if the FAA were aware of it, that would uh, they would not be happy uh, because that would clearly fall under the commercial category, and they uh, those uh, uh, certifications are almost uh, nil. There are very very few of those. So. Until uh, September 2015, we're going to work under these interim guidelines, um, and uh, we can only hope that what is proposed or what eventually is adopted is more rational uh, than what we currently have. And this may be an area that some of you may wish to, uh, I mean, we will certainly be involved in the, uh, when it goes uh, for the public uh, comment period when it's finally made available, which probably will be late this year or early next year. Um, but we're keenly involved in this, and so we know, you know a lot of the, the process and the pitfalls. Um, but uh, some of you, if you're passionate about this, you may also wish to uh, contribute uh, once the uh, draft rules are published. But as they, as uh, it's uh, known right now the new rules should be uh, in place by September 2015. However, as we all know, you know, the federal government oftentimes misses these deadlines. So. Uh, Bill, has a, uh, Bill has a second question. Are there currently navigation systems for uh, 
autonomous control of the UAS available off the shelf. And Bill, I, I'm going to unmute you. So uh, you, um, you know, is there anything else you want to, you know, you want to uh, add to that question? No, just I'm, I'm curious about uh, being able to program the, the UAS to fly over specific grid and take the photos. How's that actual control done? Okay. okay. Um, we, we purchase, uh, both of our copters come from Microcopter, and it's uh, spelled with a K, out of Germany. Uh, and I'm not endorsing, I'm not, I mean, again, there's probably 50 different rotary platforms that I could tell you about. Um, it's just we use this one because um, our teammates at the University of Florida, who we owe entire credit to for uh, their engineers, and they have uh, uh, evaluated a number of platforms and feel that this is uh, one of the better. Uh, it's extremely um, uh, uh, versatile system, uh, extremely stable which is uh, one thing we look for uh, when we're trying to get this uh, uh, information, aerial information. Um, uh, so uh, when we buy that, uh, MK, we comes with that is uh, flight, uh, flight software. And so uh, it's uh, fairly simple. Um, again, it's uh, you would down. What we do, for example, when we I'll give you an example. When we go over to Greenleaf Nursery in Parkville, Oklahoma, we simply download a Google Earth image of the area we're interested in. Uh, we then uh, load that into the MK flight software, and you'll have a picture. And you kind of saw that uh, it was it was very small, but uh, was maybe my eighth slide. And then what you'll do is. Um, uh, you can either do it uh, with your touch point or you can move the copter and uh, so there's a variety of ways to enter the, what are called waypoints. Uh, Dr. And Robbins, uh, and, Dr. Robbins, do yes. you want me to uh, go back to your slides? You can show that, that you can show that page? Um, sure. Okay. So what you do is... In so so table, now you're the presenter. You're the presenter. Right. You can show us that... Yeah, that, that, that page. Go that, back to the page. I'll show you where this is. Somewhere in here. Uh, there it is right here. So, no. yep. Okay, there we go. And then I'll show you right here. Can you see these? So there's a flight path at the bottom. This is actually a photograph of what your laptop looks like. Um, it tells us the altitude, the battery, uh, and then this was the flight plan that we, uh, can you all see that? Yes? Yes, I can see that. And uh, so we, you just enter, you want it to go um, uh, what the specific flight path is. Uh, and again, the newest uh, navigation software that we just installed also has an auto takeoff. So it immediately takes off to, uh, so let's say, five, six feet, and it stays there. Um, and then we engage, in this case, a, a pre-programmed flight. It will go to that uh, first waypoint. And let's say that's at 10 feet. And then um, and we, we tell it how long we want it to stay there, uh, the altitude. Um, there's lots of information that you input. And then uh, let's say it was stayed there for five seconds and then go to the second waypoint, and now you want it to go up to 50 feet. It will elevate on its own. And then uh, we can bring it back to our home position, uh, disengage this, and then ask it to automatically uh, uh, land. And um, the landing is actually kind of scary. I haven't done it yet, but I'd like to put like a, a coin or something on the ground. It, it, it appears to re-land itself almost you know, within uh, you know, maybe an inch or so of its original takeoff position. So it's quite precise. So the thought was that you would um, uh, say, I want it to go over blocks B and C, and, uh, you know, at this flight altitude, because that's, you know, I didn't even, that's a totally different uh, talk, but obviously we're looking at uh, such factors as what altitude is best for this kind of application. Um, uh, 
what uh, you know, how does plant spacing, uh, plant color, texture, flowers, uh, the presence of dead plants, etc. Those are all the things we're working on. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, I talked to a colleague at North Carolina State, and just as a hobbyist, he bought uh, himself for Christmas, uh, and I apologize, I forget the name of it, I think it was Panther, um, but he bought one uh, from uh, Amazon, uh, I think, or eBay, and it was about $750, and he can also, uh, uh, it comes with software, so he can pre-program a flight. So I don't think that that feature, um, Unless you get into very low cost, uh, that should be a feature that would be fairly uh, common, I think. Does that answer the question? Yes? Uh, Bill, Bill, did that answer your question? Yes, yes. That? Yes, okay. that, yes, that's right. Thank you. And uh, again, this, this uh, pre-programmed flight is kind of scary. I mean, because you, again, tell it to, to go and, and then uh, it just, you know, it does this. And then for our purposes, when it gets to the center of the location, then that's when we trigger a, a specific sensor. Um, but it, it's, you know, can be quite autonomous um, when everything's working fine. Okay, well, that's, uh, I, I don't see any more uh, questions uh, popping up, so uh, this concludes our uh, uh, webinar. What, do we have any more questions? If you do, type it in the uh, question uh, uh, text box. And again, Dr. Gu, anyone is, uh, uh, you know, I'd be delighted to talk with any of you further about this, either on the telephone or through email. Uh, and, and Dr. Gu, I appreciate you putting this together. I mean, I think this is, uh, I can sit here in my pajamas and uh, uh, give a <laughs> webinar. No, I'm kidding. But I mean, I really think that you've, uh, this is extremely efficient and you've got some great timely topics. Uh, so I applaud you for uh, coming up with this uh, format and, uh, and appreciate those that uh, were interested in hearing about this specific topic. So thank you. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Uh, this concludes our uh, webinars. And, and again, I uh, would like to remind you, please fill out the evaluation survey just to help us. Thank you.